Hey guys, so today I'm going to go over uh, a bunch of optimization techniques and best practices uh, for Unity. This is specifically uh, for virtual reality. Obviously, uh, these optimization techniques will work whether you're developing for VR or not. But um, I'm going to try and focus on some of the, the best practices that I found um, in my time developing for virtual reality. So, without further ado, um, I'm going to start by talking about the frame rate. So the frame rate is going to be the singular most important thing uh, when developing with Unity. Uh, because VR utilizes two cameras, which means you need to account for double the processing power. Um, and it also means that you need a, you want to maintain a frame rate of 90 FPS, um, which is relatively difficult given the constraints um, imposed upon us. So uh, frame rate uh, is going to be driven a lot by draw calls, and draw calls are going to come from your CPU limit. So depending on the power of your CPU, that'll uh, determine how many draw calls you're allowed to have. Um, the other thing that uh, really affects frame rate is the number, uh, number amount of texture memory usage. So a lot of times, uh, too many too many textures uh, will cause a GPU fill rate problem, and you never want to run into that. So we'll go into some mitigation strategies on that a little bit. Um, just want you to be aware. Third thing, obviously, uh, poly counts. The poly counts um, another super important thing. So as far as uh, ballpark estimates of your budget on the poly count. Um, I like to stay uh, below a million uh, polys on my VR projects if I'm developing for the Rift of the Vive. Now, you can definitely go higher and lower than what I'm talking about, but a million um, with, some, with complex interactions and physics and everything that's going around, around you is probably um, a safe bet uh, for just about every system um, from the 970 up. Uh, if you're developing strictly for the 1080 Ti, um, whatever, uh, you got some super super up to rig and it's, it's not a consumer facing application, um, feel free to bump that up um, as much as you want. But in general, um, I found about a million uh, million polys is good. For your mobile VR budget, um, if you're you know on uh, cardboard or gear VR, I like to say 100,000 triangles, but uh, you know that's obviously it's highly dependent on the type of project and the type of interactions you're having within that you're seeing. Um, Cool. So useful tools. Um, the stats window, probably the single most important uh, and easy to use tool um, that you should always be using is the stats window. So uh, the stats window, you can find that by clicking on stats. Uh, on the, so you got to be in the game view. If you click on stats, it's right next to mute audio uh, and by your gizmos. And it's just going to give you a, a quick little look at your tries, your FPS, um, and how many uh, batches are being saved, things like that. Um, so that's like a quick look at um, basically what your camera is seeing and how it's rendering. Uh, so you're all, you, should all, I mean, you should definitely turn that on if you're worried about performance or if things are stuttering. Um, it'll give you a sense of which objects that you're looking at are giving you those problems. Following on the stats window is the frame debugger. So the frame debugger can be accessed um, by window frame debugger. And just like it says, it shows you what's happening on uh, withdrawing every object um, in your current frame. Next, uh, you're going to want to check out the profiler. So the profiler is uh, probably the most intensive um, debugging tool that we have. And basically, uh, you can access that with window profiler. And you're going to be able to see the CPU usage, the GPU usage, everything. So um, if you're in the profiler right now, um, basically gr the green bars are as, is, no is your rendering time. The blue is uh, script uh, script usage. So if you see a big blue spike, um, which is very common um, in if you're trying to debug, then you know that there's a specific script that's hogging a lot of resources right there. So if you actually click on that spike, for example, you'll be able to see the call stack from the script, um, and it will kind of tell you which of your uh, what, what what parts of your code are, are giving uh, Unity the problems. So uh, those are probably the most useful tools um, as far as tips and tricks go. Um, I got a lot. So let's start with batching. Um, so batching is enabled by default, and basically what it is, is it's when you take all the verts and meshes and combine them into single meshes. So if you have a couple of barrels next to each other, let's combine those into one mesh, um, is basically what that is. So there's two types of batching, static and dynamic. I'm going to go over static right now, um, I'll leave dynamic for later, but basically um, static batching is... That is the if you if you're not going to learn anything else from this video, learn about static batching because this is literally the single most uh, performance intensive or performance saving uh, gain that you can get. So basically, the way it works is uh, you can turn uh, floors, walls, etc. into static objects, and that'll net a huge performance gain because Unity won't worry about recalculating um, a lot of the physics interactions that'll happen with it. So. Uh, it's actually really easy to do. So if you go to your uh, scene and you click on, let's say, the walls, for example. So shift select the game objects that have the wall meshes. And there's a checkbox at the top right. Um, it would be in your, uh, in your uh, inspector view. There's a little checkbox 
uh, followed by the word static at the top. If you check that, um, Unity will calculate uh, that geometry as static and you'll net a massive performance gain. So the way I like to do this is once you finish setting up your scene and you're about to make a build, go ahead and set um, all of those objects that are not gonna move as static and you will see uh, a nice little performance bump from that. Cool, so texture atlas scene. Um, another, this is a pretty common uh, one, especially for 2D games, uh, but it can definitely be useful even for VR as well. So texture atlas scene is the idea that you wanna make one single material that many objects can share. Um, so you can actually accomplish this uh, because of the underlying UV coordinates um, that make up the material. And uh, unfortunately, there's no built-in texture atlasing tool um, inside of Unity, but there's a lot of stuff on the asset store that you'll find that'll do the job quite well. Um, you could also create it yourself um, in uh, ZBrush or whatever, whatever program you're using. So I uh, highly recommend learning about that. Um, also, one, one thing I forgot, quick note about batching. Um, you can actually combine meshes on your own um, in the barrel example, for example, uh, by using mesh.combinedmesh. It's, uh, it's a function within the mesh class. So just a quick note on that. Uh, okay, Unity Terrain. So my view of the Unity Terrain is it's beautiful, it's expressive, um, it's just so expensive to render. Uh, I always, you know, consider using a low poly terrain or a custom one, poly crush, whatever you want to do. Um, I, I really dislike using the Unity Terrain because it just uses such a significant portion of your budget for the uh, for virtual reality. There's just no reason to use it. Uh, I know some people are going to disagree. They're, they're going to say, I always use the terrain and it's, it's great. And yeah, that's fine. You know, if you really want to use the terrain, go for it. Um, just be aware of how much it costs. And um, another note, if you are going to use the terrain, uh, don't use the trees. Or if you are going to use the trees, use the mobile versions of the trees. Um, I know that in the standard assets package that Unity gives you, um, it comes with trees, grass, etc. Um, use the mobile versions of all of those. Um, it'll save you a lot. Um, okay, mid mapping. So... Mint mapping is the idea that you can automatically create low res textures for things far or small away. Um, so basically, it's like LOD grouping, but for textures. Um, and if you don't know what LOD grouping is, don't worry, we're going to go over that in a bit. But the idea is that you want to have multiple textures for every object so that you can load in the lower res ones um, and the, or the higher res ones. You can swap them in and out as needed, depending on the distance from the player. Um, so you can turn this on for every texture, and you should. Um, and Unity will create a few different sizes for optimal usage. So to do this, uh, just go ahead and go to the texture that you're using, go to its properties, and there should be a little button that lets you generate the mint maps for each texture. So um, just as we previously discussed, LOD groups. So level of detail groups, that's, that's what that stands for. And basically you want to use, LOD groups is the idea that you want to use different models uh, for different levels of detail. Uh, so you want to switch out different models depending on the distance from the actual uh, model itself. Uh, so a good example of that would be if you're a player and you're 100 meters away from a castle, for example, right? Now, your castle model might be somewhere between 25 to 50,000 polys. And, but at 100 meters away, you can't really discern a lot of the features that those polys are going into. So instead of loading that 50,000 poly uh, castle, we've we're going to load instead a 5,000 poly version of that castle that looks just about the same from that distance. And that's the idea behind an LOD group, is that at 100 meters, you see that 5,000 poly castle. At 50 meters, you might see a 25,000 poly castle. Now that you're a little closer, you can make out some of the more details. And then once you get right up to it, you load the final 50,000 poly uh, castle. So this allows you to kind of cheat with your budget because you're loading different, um, different poly counts on the objects depending on the distance and the actual, what's actually gonna be able to be viewed. So these, uh, the only problem with LED groups is you're actually gonna need those physical models um, with the lower poly counts. Uh, and that can be kind of challenging, especially for a small team. But luckily, um, there are a few tools out there that will automatically create LED groups for certain models, depending um, on the input model. The one I like to use uh, is called Simplygon. Uh, it's a great, great mesh deformation tool, um, highly recommended, and it's free. I believe, I believe there's a free tier so um, you get a couple uh, every month or, or whatever. So go ahead and check that out if you're curious about LOD groups and any sort of uh, mesh deformation in general. And also uh, distance calling. So distance calling is the idea that we make objects disappear at a far distance. Um, so you can use special layers or the uh, camera.layerCallDistances function to accomplish this. 
Um, and this will make objects disappear if they are past certain threshold distances from the camera. Um, so the ideal scenario for this would be if you're in a first person game, um, you know, we might want to disappear any sort of grass that's outside of five meters away um, because the user won't be able to interact with it or see it in any way um, either way. So that would be a nice little performance bump. Lights. Um, so try to use one light per object. Uh, don't ever use light mode auto if you can, if you can avoid it. Um, you want to explicitly set the light to either be important or not important. Um, and last note would be vertex lighting is cheap, pixel lighting is expensive. So use vertex lighting as much as you can. Um, avoid the pixel lights, but you know feel free to use it sporadically if you if you have a, a scene that really needs to be well lit. Um, but lights are expensive, so remember that. Um, shadows obviously high quality shadows are expensive, so go ahead and use the low quality ones if you can. Um, shadow casters also increase your vert count, um, so be careful. Uh, so turn them off on objects that you don't need shadows for. So um, the obvious example here would be your ground in your scene. does not need to cast shadows. Um, there's just no reason. And there, there might be a lot of other objects in your scene as well that potentially don't need shadows. Um, but uh, here to save your shadows are your baked light maps. So a baked light map is probably one of the more important things as well um, when it comes to your final build because uh, instead of rendering the lights uh, and the shadows and everything like that all in real time, uh, we can actually bump that load to the GPU instead. And the way we're going to do that is by actually calculating the light maps in advance. So in order for the baked light maps to work, if you remember when we talked about static batching, we need a lot of static objects in your scene because those static objects, we're going to bake their lights. Um, and then we're going to generate this light map. And the light map is basically... Uh, a texture of all the lighting. So it can't change, but it's cheap to render. Um, so my advice to you would be to use this when you are creating a build. So let's say you have a demo or you know RC1, RC2, whatever. When you're ready to make a build, uh, go ahead and go to your window lighting, bake that light map, and then use it and get those performance gains. Um, so overdraw. Overdraw is a problem that you might encounter. So it's the process of rendering multiple objects on top of each other. And usually, so usually what happens is because of transparent shaders, um, Unity has Unity has real problems with zero-order rendering. Um, but basically, you'll 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 see a lot of flickering, or you might um, you'll have things just render on top of each other. Um, and so there's actually a special tool you can uh, use inside of Unity that should show you overdraw. But so this is pretty common also on mobile, um, especially with UI, um, or if you have a building with a wall, and behind that wall there's a ton of buildings or objects. Unity will try to draw them, and having to z-sort them, it's going to cause you a lot of overdraw. So to mitigate that, we have occlusion culling. Um, occlusion culling is basically not drawing things that are outside of your sight ranges. So this will solve all your overdraw problems, um, and it's really easy to use. Uh, the only I, It might be a Unity Pro feature. I know it used to be. Um, it might not anymore, but if it's not, definitely go for the occlusion culling because um, that'll solve all your overdraw problems. So if you have any z-order issues, um, especially on the 3D, go for the occlusion culling. Finally, um, I want to leave you guys with a few code tips as well that I've uh, kind of compiled. So these are the most common uh, mistakes, I guess, that I see. Uh, always, always cache your references to get component calls. I never want to see a get component in the update loop. If I, if, if you, see, if you have any get components in the update loop. Uh, just store them, store them as a store a reference to that uh, in the start or in any other function that runs once, um, and then use that in the update instead because it's just a waste of resources. There's no reason to be doing that. Um, don't use find objects by name or by type or, or by anything um, because Unity will do a string search across every game object in your scene, and that's really slow. And there's no reason to use that. Um, it's just a crutch. Same thing with send message and broadcast message. These are, these are crutches that Unity put in um, to kind of give you a leg up, but you should never design or architect your programs to use these because you can. there's always better ways of accomplishing um, whatever it is that you're trying to do with these. Um, yeah, so go ahead and use generics. Don't use link. Um, it's costly. It's expensive. Uh, Raycasts and distance checks are super cheap, so use them as liberally as you, as you please. Um, there's literally thousands of them being run every physics update anyway because that's how uh, a lot of things are calculated internally. So go ahead and use those as much as you want. And uh, yeah, so I know that was a pretty fast explanation um, through a lot of concepts. 
Uh, I guess what I really want you guys to get away from this is uh, I wanted to dip your feet into a bunch of different optimization techniques that I found. And if you feel that any of them uh, are kind of your calling or you know you want to you want to go deeper into them, there's tons of material out there um, that Unity has put out. There's a lot of good talks um, that come out of Unite. So if you look at the Unite videos, there's you know um, tons of awesome talks on, on all of these topics. Um, but yeah, so like I said, I know that was fast, but uh, if you have any questions or comments or concerns or whatever, go ahead and uh, leave a comment on the video and I'll try and respond as fast as I can. Thank you guys for watching.